Uh, as we turn our attention to the last part of the prayer where Jesus said, this is then how you should pray, we're going to focus in on verses 14 and 15. Now, I want to read this again and read it relatively slow so we can take it in. I know we've been meditating on it and my prayers, we've been practicing it as well. But look in verse 9, and then we'll make our way down to 14 and 15. So 9 says, this then is how you should pray. So he's saying, hey, here's how you do it. And, and, and he, we walked through this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. But now when we make our way down to 12, it says this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now you should underline that because that is he says, that's how you should pray. But that portion of the prayer is going to get more explanation when we find our way down to 14 and 15. 13 says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then he puts this qualifier and emphasis on 14 and 15 where he says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men when they're when, when forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, these two verses um, give an emphasis to verse 12. They bring clarity. They are a um, qualifier. That they help us understand fully. And it's interesting because of the model prayer that we are to pray, that section gets this emphasis and the others doesn't. This is very interesting to me. Now, there are some things in the two verses we should note. If you would underline the second word of verse 14, if you can underline the second word of verse 15, there you will see the little word if. For if you forgive men, but if you do not forgive men, that little word is very key. It's that word that I have used to give the title to the message. The if of prayer. And this is very important because it is a conditional thing for us. If means if. <laughs> if we do it. Uh, some things in life only work if you work them. Take your car, for example. It will provide you transportation from place to place if you start it and if you drive it, right? It's there, it works, but it's conditional upon your action to engage it. Uh, the same thing is true with, our, with, with food. Food will nourish your body and give you strength if you prepare it and if you eat it, right? I mean, if it's there and it's nutritional, it'll help you and energize you and give you what you need to sustain you if you engage it. Now, those are two very simple illustrations. But the same is true with forgiveness. If we engage it, if we understand it, like we should biblically, then it, the impact of it is absolutely unbelievable. It, it, is, it, is, it is a work of God. It is beyond us. It's something God does in us and through us for His glory. And it's beautiful and it's powerful. But I'm afraid that too many people use the term forgiveness lightly, uh, without full knowledge of what it really means. We all have, forgive me, or oh, you should forgive me. And we've not really thought through what is forgiveness. And today I really want us to grasp it. I'm going to raise many questions that will help us engage it to understand what forgiveness really is. And it is a choice. The if means it's a choice to obey and it's not based on your feelings or my feelings because if we were honest, we don't wake up and go, I can't wait to go and ask somebody to forgive me. Or I can't wait to go and, and give some forgiveness to someone else today. Well, we don't do that, now do we? Okay, this is kind of that awkward stage of, well, they should come to me and I'm sure not going to go to them and how dare they hurt me and why should I forgive them? Our human nature kind of repels what this is all about. But it is this very principle 
It is this very thing that God did for us in Jesus that allows us to even consider it. That is forgiveness. So it's not based on your feelings or my feelings to engage it. It is a choice, listen, of obedience, trusting that what God says about it is true for you and me. There's someone here today, I promise you, in a crowd this size that needs to engage this truth and apply it. We all need to apply it. The question is, will we let God reveal to us in what relationships and in what way should we, must we obey this conditional if so that forgiveness does what it needs to do in and through us for God's glory? That's the question. So what is this forgiveness? Forgiveness is unearned mercy. To forgive is a choice to release debt. It's to say you owe me nothing. I forgive you. I hold no claim against you. I remember when I was uh, very young and I bought my first car. I was working for minimum wage, paying a car note. Um, it probably wasn't that much, but it seemed enormous to me. And I remember when I got it paid off and the bank gave me the title to the car, I thought, man, it feels good to pay debt off, right? I own this now. I'm not in debt to the bank, right? And, and, and that's what it is. It's to say, you do not owe me anything. And so often we hold people in debt and they don't even know they're in debt to us. But we should forgive people. <laughs> Let's live free. Let's trust it to God. Why live in your hurt? Why live within a prison of unforgiveness toward other people for a day, for a moment, for a lifetime? Why do people do that? And I'm going to make the case today at some point in the message that I believe that happens to you and to me because Satan knows it's one of his classic tools to make you and I ineffective in proclaiming the gospel. Because if we can't forgive, we have a very hard time preaching a gospel of forgiveness. We've got to live in its reality in order to proclaim it to others as we should. And if he can get us all bound up in unforgiveness toward others, if we don't live in the reality of our own forgiveness that comes in Jesus Christ, we find it very hard to offer it to others. So we need to get this, grasp this, live in the reality of it. And so there's three things I want us to look at today. In verse 14, we're going to look at if we do forgive, Verse 15, if we do not forgive. And then lastly, I just want to make a point why we should forgive. Those three things will help us grasp all of this connected to effective praying as the Lord has instructed us to pray this way. So this is part of it. Let's begin with verse 14, if we do forgive. He says in verse 14, for if you forgive men, conditional, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So let's break this down and talk about it a little bit. When we do forgive, what happens is we live in the character of God. God is a God of forgiveness. He has forgiven you and He's forgiven me in Christ. And from that position, we can now forgive. Don't get this backwards and say, okay, um, I'm going to forgive you so that I can be forgiven. That's backwards. You have the ability to forgive because you've been forgiven. It's not a transactional thing that you do that you get. No, you're able to give because you've already received. That's really the point here. And once our debts are forgiven, then we forgive from the reality of the character of God. Forgiveness is granted to all whether they are deserving or are undeserving. And the truth of the matter is, we're all undeserving for the forgiveness that we've received in Christ for we were sinners in the presence of a holy God. He didn't have to, but He did because He loved us. He forgave us so that we can be forgiven and that we can have relationship with holy God and sin no longer has to taint and separate us from Him. So we are undeserving. But when you and I forgive, we truly live in the character and the reality of God. And when we forgive, we cancel debt both immediately and, listen, into the future. The future part is probably the, more, the part that we don't think much about. But it is true. Not only do we forgive immediately, 
And we say, I, I, I'm not going to charge you anymore. You're not in debt to me anymore. I forgive you. But you've got to forgive into the future. Because in relationships, when they break, when they are offensive one to another, there is ongoing damage that occurs because of the offense. It's broken relationships. It's misrepresented reputations. Um, there's haunting realities that come from choices of sin that enter into our lives. You know, you, you go out and you're driving down the road. Think about it like this. You're driving down the road and, and, um, and you run into somebody with your car. Not on purpose. Not, not on purpose. I know none of y'all would do that. But you run into somebody by accident. But it's your fault. The police show up. They call the police. And you get out and you say, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? And the person says, okay, I forgive you. Everything's going to be okay. This is all good. And so then, you know, uh, you get in your car. You drive home. And everything's good. It, it just never happened, right? You were forgiven. No. Guess what? Now you got to get your car fixed. Now you got to deal with two different insurance agencies. Uh, now you got to deal with the phone call that comes and the person that hit you now has a neck ache. And then all of a sudden it's this and it's that and it's all these things that carry on for months and months and even years sometimes, right? It's just not, you're forgiven and it's over. You've got to forgive in the present and into the future if you use that as an illustration. I like the illustration that uh, a gentleman by the name of Don wrote about a time that he was engaged to a girl. And he said that he had to uh, forgive her not just because the engagement broke off, but he had to forgive her ongoing into the future. He said, there was a time I was engaged to a young woman who changed her mind. He said, I forgave her. But I could not send away my emotions in one single moment of decision and effort. That was done in small sums over years. I forgave when I spoke with her and refrained from rehearsing the past. I forgave whenever I saw her with another man. I forgave when I had to renounce jealousy and self-pity. I forgave when I prayed for her as she moved into other relationships. I forgave when I praised her and spoke of her value, though I wanted to slice away at her reputation. Those were the payments but she never saw them. And her own payments were unseen by me. I, I do not know what her private trials were, but I do know that she forgave me. See, sometimes we forgive initially, immediately, but we fail to realize it's going to keep coming up that we're going to have to continue to forgive. An emotional moment where we feel like, well, well, maybe I can say something that will tear them down and build me up. No, you forgive them. You see them with someone else. You say, I forgive them. It's okay. I don't have to go there. And so there is both the immediate and the ongoing potential where the enemy will come and say, ah, hey, what about this and, and what about that? And I want to ask you the question, when that temptation comes, do you still live in the reality that you have forgiven them? Or do you go back to the past? And you say, yeah, you know, I did forgive them, but they sure did do me wrong. And if you're living in that somewhere into the future, and that's a potential for you, and, and you engage that, then you then once again immediately put yourself in prison, and you negate the forgiveness that you gave them because you've now said, I'm not willing to forgive them. I, I take it back, is really what you're saying. When we truly forgive, we're able to release them. You know, release them. Fully. Humanity's <laughs> humanity, we are going to disappoint one another. And we've got to learn to forgive one another. That's why the Bible talks so much about it. Release them. You ought to thank them. You say, thank them? Yes. For building your character. Thank them <laughs> for allowing you to become like Christ. He said, but I suffered. Well, Christ suffered too. Didn't Stephen suffer, but yet he forgave them? Didn't Jesus suffer on the cross? He said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we forgive, we are more like Christ than ever. It's beautiful. It's powerful. Why are you letting someone rob you of that? Thank them for building your character. Bless them. Instead of cursing them, wish, wishing harm on them, bless them. Pray for God's best for them. 
And I would say to you, don't kick somebody to the curb for a single offense. Don't be the judge, the jury, and the jailer, and the executioner all at once. <laughs> Just think if someone had treated you that way. How many times have you failed someone? How, how many times have you disappointed someone? Now, if there's a habitual pattern of dysfunction, you have to, you, you've got to have some good boundaries. You, you've got to say, okay, something's not quite right here. We're not going to... We're not going to approve of this. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying let's give some grace to one another, right? We should, because grace has been given to us. Let me raise this question. How do we know when we have truly granted forgiveness? I, I, in my life, these things are true. I have a burden for the offender to be set free with forgiveness. I'm not trying to hold them accountable. I want them to be set free. I began praying for the offender instead of talking about them and trying to control them. I have a desire for them to be free. And so I'm praying for them. And doesn't the Lord say that you are to pray for your enemies? Well, good as if you pray for those who love you, but pray for your enemies instead, right? And when we pray for our enemies, we are like Christ. And we're trusting that he's in control. And then I know that I've truly forgiven when I desire that through the experience the relationship can be restored. See, if the heart is for restoration and reconciliation, reconciliation and restoration, right, then the heart is in the right place. Now, I can't demand it. I can't make it happen. But if my heart is in a position that that will occur, then I know that I have forgiven and I am, am willing to forgive into the future as I need to for the glory of God. And if someone doesn't reconcile, and if someone is not restored, it's not a deal breaker for me because it's not up to me to make them do that. But I have my part to make sure my heart is in the right place. That's key. Here's some more questions about biblical forgiveness. Let me, let me just raise some of these because you may be thinking them. And you want answers. Now, question number one here is, is forgiveness a sign of weakness? You know, some people struggle with that. Well, I'm, I'm strong. I don't need to go do that. Let me just say to you, forgiveness is a sign of strength and real power. It's not weakness. Second question, when I forgive, does this mean I will forget? No, you are not, you're not going to. It, and more than likely, it's going to pop up again somewhere in your mind. It'll come back into your life in some way. To forgive one time is not um, like the Lord who forgives and he throws it as far from the east as from the west. No. I mean, the enemy can even bring it back up to you in your mind. So you've got to be prepared. It's not a one and done forever thing. And then you say, well, okay then, okay, well then how many times should I forgive someone? I'm tired of doing this. Well, that question was raised to the Lord and he said, well, okay, 70 times 7. Go do the math. That's a lot of times, simply meaning ongoing. We, we can't choose to cut off forgiveness because we're tired of giving it. Now, good boundaries, yes. Wisdom, yes. But to say I'll no longer forgive, you just can't do that. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Here's a fourth question. Does everyone face having to forgive? Y-E-S, yes. Every person in this room will engage this topic, this reality that you must forgive. Every innocent child that's in this room will grow up and face the need to understand this forgiveness, both personally and relationally to other people. And if that's true, and it is, shouldn't we understand it? Shouldn't we know how to apply it? We've got to graduate from, oh, I forgive you. Oh, you should forgive me. Oh, it's just, just some light little thing that we talk about and we misuse the word because we don't fully understand it. We've got to get beyond that to understand the significance of true, genuine forgiveness because we all face it. Now, let's look at verse 15. If we do not forgive, he says this, but if you do not forgive, there's the conditional if, men their sins your father will not forgive your sins hmm interesting 
Now, this has uh, been a challenge for some people when you stop to really try to think about this and understand it, but you've got to understand it from the fact that we have been forgiven. If we put ourselves in a position where we're unwilling to forgive, we put ourselves in a position where the Lord can't forgive us because sin reigns in our hearts. And I wonder, and I wonder how many Christians are holding back forgiveness. How many? How many? I, I, I don't really have a way to answer that, but I think there are many who hold back, who are unwilling to forgive. And so I want to raise and pose four questions to help us grasp why this is. The first question is this, why wouldn't I forgive if I'm a Christian? Well, I think there's four reasons. One is this, you've not found personal forgiveness yourself. You may claim to know the Lord, you may claim to be forgiven, but you're not really saved. It's called being a lost church member. It's called being someone who professes Christ, but they've never really accepted Christ. You've never truly been forgiven yourself. You've never per you cannot give what you have not found personally. You've got to be forgiven yourself. Secondly, if you have been saved, you have experienced the Lord's forgiveness, second option would be this. You have forgotten that you have been forgiven. Let me tell you how many times that happens to me. A lot. I, I forget just how much the Lord has done for me. When he shed his blood on the cross and he forgave my sins when I was not worthy and he didn't have to do that. Where would I be today without Christ? I need to remember that. And, and if I can grasp that and remember how much has been, uh, been done for me in my life and how I have been forgiven, then I am willing to offer it to others. Have you forgotten just how much the Lord has done for you? Thirdly, it could be that we do not forgive because we have failed to forgive. We just figure we know better on this issue than God does. I'm not doing that. That's, that's how we deal with that. I'm not doing that. If that person did that to me, I'm, I'm not forgiving them. Are you kidding me? And you're a Christian, right? Your life's been changed, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not forgiving them. What? What's the Bible say about forgiveness? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not doing that. What? Stop and realize what you're saying. You're just saying everything that, the, that, is, that your whole salvation is based on, you're going to reject because you're just not going to do it. You're just failing to forgive. And here's another possibility of why we don't forgive is that we have faked real forgiveness. We put human effort as cover up. We put up a, a mask and we go, oh yeah, I've forgiven them, but really we have not. We're faking. And we don't really forgive them. We walk away and then we talk bad about them. We get around, a, a, you know, the lunch table, the dinner table, or we're at home or wherever we feel comfortable, and we begin to, to tear that person down and talk about how bad they, they've treated us. And, and the real heart comes out that, yes, we may have verbally said, I forgive you. And then we go over here to dinner and we go, rah, 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 and we just tear them all to shreds, right? We're faking. <laughs> That's not real forgiveness. Forgiveness is good to their face. And when they're not around, when we've really forgiven, and, and, and the real heart is, and it's not a fake spiritual kind of thing where we say, well, I'm really praying for them to get right. No, we really mean it. We're brokenhearted for them, and we're trusting them to God, and we have forgiven them, and we've moved on, and we're not in a prison, and we're not holding them in one. See, I believe that when we really forgive we're not in a mode of being deceived and defeated by Satan. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, Paul speaks of this. He said, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. It's verse 11 that I'm moving toward, and here it is. Verse 11, in order, in order, he has forgiven in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. See, unforgiveness is a scheme of the devil to cause us to live in an ineffective way with the gospel. And he can destroy a church in a second. 
if we don't live by forgiveness, and if we don't proclaim forgiveness as we should, we will be so ineffective. And, and Paul knew that. He said, I forgive. Y'all should forgive. We should all forgive. So Satan does not outwit us because we're not unaware of his schemes. Second question is, what's the, what's the big deal if I don't forgive? Here are four facts of what you will experience. You, choose, you, you say, well, I'm not forgiving. I'm not going to do that. Well, let me tell you where that takes you, what kind of road that leads you down. These are some of the things I've seen, I've experienced, I've seen both in people's lives. One is regret. It leaves us down on ourselves. We're trying to constantly lift ourselves up by tearing the other person down. Really, it's a form of regret. Paul said this, he said, I'm putting my past behind me and I'm pressing on for what's ahead. That's an attitude of forgiveness. The other road we may go down is one of resentment. It leaves us bitter toward others. And didn't the Bible say that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? Well, I mean, this is so basic. But we see our neighbor and we can't stand to look at them. What? It, 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 it's a road, unforgiveness leads you down a road of resentment. And then it can even graduate to things that are worse than just personal internal turmoil, turmoil inside of us. It can actually lead us to revenge. We become combative toward others. And this is why in Romans 12, 17, and 19 it says this, Repay no one evil for evil. You know why? You and I have the tendency, to, we have the ability in our flesh to do it. That person got me, I'm going to get them. They did evil to me. In my flesh, I'm going to do evil to them. I'm going to pay them back. Don't think, you're not beyond, don't think you're beyond that. In our flesh, we're all, we all can do that. And this is why we got to forgive. So we don't move to the level of going down the road of revenge. Or, and this is a devastating one, is to repress if we don't forgive, we repress. We pretend an offense never happened, and we, think, and we think we can ignore the hurt. And if we ignore it long enough, if I can just act like it's not there long enough, it'll disappear. <laughs> Doesn't happen. It keeps resurfacing. It keeps impacting you. Repress means to reject from, from the conscious mind painful or disagreeable ideas, memories, feelings, or impulses. And a lot of people live like that. They go, well, I'm just going to repress this. I'm going to act like that never happened. It never happened. It never happened. It never happened. It never happened. <sighs> I believe that never happened. And then all of a sudden, you're right back in it. All of a sudden, you're right back in it. Because you've never truly forgiven. And there you are. And the enemy goes, got him. Got him right where I want him. In unforgiveness. Third question. What is false forgiveness? There's four types that we engage in. One is partial. I will forgive part of the sin, but not all the sin. We think, well, I'll forget. That's not true forgiveness. True forgiveness forgives it all. Another false forgiveness type that we engage in is conditional. It's the three strikes you're out method. I'll forgive you this time, but if you do it again, I just don't know. And if you do it three times, I'm done with you. Is that forgiveness? No. No. How about temporary? I'll forgive you uh, uh, now, but, but, and we put people on probation. But if you do this, and but if you do that, and I got you, is that forgiveness? That's not forgiveness. How about selective forgiveness? Some things we forgive, others we will not. That person's not worthy of my forgiveness in that area. What? Is that forgiveness? That's not forgiveness. Partial, conditional, temporary, selective. Those are all forms of false forgiveness that we engage in and think we're forgiving when we're actually not forgiving at all. So what is question number four, biblical forgiveness? Biblical for forgiveness is a full, full, complete release of all debt associated with the person who offends you for the present and the future. I've said these things to myself, and I'll read them to you, so maybe you can say them to yourselves. I found them to be helpful. I say to myself, Mark, forgive completely. Here's why. Don't be a victim. Be a victor. Don't hold back forgiveness, but give freely. Don't live in revenge. Leave the, the job of judgment to God. 
Don't live in bitterness, but brokenness. That's where we find forgiveness. Don't give faults to forgiveness. Make it real, Mark. Don't enthrone resentment in your heart, Mark. Don't hold a grudge. Ask God to bless your enemies, Mark. Pray for your enemies. You should try some of those. They're powerful. They work. It's God's way. I don't know. I've been there. I, I, I've said this, and maybe you, you, you're thinking this yourself. You say, okay, I, I, okay, that's biblical forgiveness, but, you know, why do I have to do this? Why, why do I got to get involved in all this forgiveness business? Why doesn't God just handle this thing? It's because God works in us and through us. We are not Christian islands unto ourselves. We're made for relationships, and relationships are hard. Relationships hurt. Relationships are spiritual. Uh, the, the enemy gets involved, but we are victorious when we live by the principles that God has given us, his truth. Now I want to ask a question. Please don't answer out loud. Please look straight ahead. Don't look around, okay? Can you think of someone you need to forgive? Now don't look around. All right, question number two. Now you've already thought about who it is, right? Who is it? It could be somebody that's already passed on. It could be somebody in this room. It could be somebody in a family, uh, in your family uh, network that you need to forgive. Now I want to ask you a, qu a second question. Can you immediately think of someone who has forgiven you? I mean fully, biblically. They just forgave you. And you offended them. Michelle was talking about this the other day about a teacher that she had. And she had a chance to go and, and say, please forgive me for back when. I don't know if you remember. And the lady said, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> and the Lord worked in that, right? I mean, you know. Can you think of someone who's genuinely forgiven you? I want you to think about this. What a gift. What a gift. And just think of the gift you can give someone else that will bless them and set you free if you'll practice what God says. The third point in the message today is simply this, why we should forgive. It's simple. It's very simple. Why should I do this? Because the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches forgiveness. God commanded us to forgive in Mark eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus is... Jesus teaches that we must hear Matthew 6 14 and 15 God is a God of forgiveness is he not praise the Lord for that Jesus modeled forgiveness first John 2 6 Jesus be was betrayed by Judas was he not he was denied by Peter wasn't he crucified by his own people and he said father forgive them for they know not what they do we are taught to forgive first Corinthians 2 we looked at that there are other models of forgiveness throughout Scripture. you got Moses and Miriam in Numbers 12. you got Stephen over in the New Testament in Acts 7 who forgave. Verses 59 and 60, such a powerful testimony of forgiveness like his Lord. I mean, it's everywhere that you read in Scripture for it is the basis of who we are in Christ. And I think this is when you understand it in this holistic picture you can begin to understand that if we don't give forgiveness, we cannot receive forgiveness because unforgiveness, the proper biblical kind, our unwillingness to engage in that is our willingness to stay in sin. We cannot just be recipients of forgiveness, but we are called to be vessels of forgiveness as well. You know, if we don't engage in forgiveness as we should, we forfeit that in our own life, but we also discredit the gospel. Unforgiveness affects my relationship with God. The Holy Spirit now ministers conviction to me instead of ministering through me. Prayer becomes more of a duty than it is a delight because I'm harboring unforgiveness in my heart. The devil gets a foothold in my life. In Ephesians, it talks about that. We focus on our hurts, not the hurting. We're more like, oh, I got hurt, and I got offended, and it's this, and it's that, and and, and, and we don't even realize how it impacts our attitude and actions toward others. And we're always kind of bringing it up and talking about it. Uh, and, and sometimes we've done it so much we don't even realize we're doing it. 
We become prisoners to unforgiveness, not ministers of forgiveness. I want to say to you, unforgiveness is bondage. It's a boomerang effect. If we do not forgive, it comes back on us, and we live in that unforgiveness ourselves. John 13, 35 Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In unforgiveness, we can not love one another. I am not advocating letting someone just come and hurt you recklessly, consistently. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about with good boundaries and wisdom We forgive so that we don't live in bondage and we can love appropriately. You know, it's always been an interesting story to me. Uh, The prodigal son, the younger son goes off. He takes the wealth and he lives in wild living and all that he did. And he realizes that he sinned against God. And he said, I will return and tell him I've sinned against the Father and I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. He returns home. But it's the older son that can never who was there doing all the things he was supposed to do in action, but in attitude he was bitter and unforgiving. And when, he, and when the younger son comes and gets right, he cannot join in the party. He cannot be a part, and he will not come in. Why? I believe he never received forgiveness. He, he had the form, but not the reality. He was lost. He needed to get saved. And that may be true for for you today, that this is all very difficult for you to to engage because you've never received forgiveness yourself. Accept Christ as your Savior, and it will begin to make sense to you. Here's the facts. For those of us who are believers in Christ and we've been forgiven, we're going to be hurt in life. We will be offended and we will be rejected. The question is, what will we do with it? How will we handle it? If we go off our feelings, we'll live in hurt, confusion. We'll begin to go after the person. We'll begin to rationalize our position. We won't accept that it's happened to us if we live in our feelings. But if we choose forgiveness, we can begin to be, we will be set free and we can set the other person free. There was a lady who raised a question. She said, she wrote this in, and R.T. Kendall answered her question. She raised a very important question. I I think it's one we should give some thought to. She raised this question. She said, can I forgive those who have betrayed me if they are not repentant? See, you can't control what other people do, right? If you're waiting on them to be repentant before you apply forgiveness, you may wait a long time. Here's what R.T. Kendall said. He said, if we wait for those who have hurt us to repent first, we will almost certainly wait for a long, long time. We also give ourselves a justification to stay bitter the rest of our lives. He went on to explain. He said, chances are high that those who hurt us don't even think they have done anything wrong. Nine out of ten people I have to forgive don't think they have done anything wrong to me, which suggests that I, too, have probably hurt people without knowing it. He tells this illustration. He says, When I was a minister at Westminster Chapel in London, the people who had betrayed me didn't think they had done one thing wrong. You could have hooked them up to a lie detector and they would have passed with flying colors. My old friend, Joseph Tyson, whom the communist government of Romania imprisoned and beat for his faith, came to me with these sobering words. He said, R.T., you must totally forgive them. Unless you totally forgive them, you will be in chains he said i never went to them and told them i forgave them this would have insulted them it happened in my heart once you forgive in your heart it ceases to be an issue whether they repent or not 
The blessing I got personally from this has been incalculable. You can't calculate it. And my point in telling you this illustration from a God-fearing, godly man, R.T. Kendall, is simply this. How many Christians are walking around with unforgiveness towards someone that doesn't even know that they've hurt you? And you got them in prison, and they don't even know they're in prison. And you're bound up in your chains because you won't forgive them. How many? How many of us are living there, have lived there? Let me, let me just say to you, only you can answer this. Only you in the solitary place with God, praying for His glory. Uh, your name be honored. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Okay, Mark, if you want my honor to be there, you want my kingdom to come, I got a little something we need to work on here. It's right here in your heart. It's that unforgiveness toward whoever it may be, whatever the situation may be. Ah, Lord, let's not talk about that today in the solitary place. Let's talk about some things I want. I want a new car. I want you to do this for me, and I want you to do... No, Mark, let's just stop for a second here, because what's really important is what's going on right here in your heart. Because if you can't take care of that unforgiveness, see, it's conditional. If you will forgive then I'm going to be able to forgive you. And then once you're set free, then you're going to be able to go out and help my kingdom come because you're going to go out and preach the gospel. And the enemy's going to hate it, but you're going to be so effective because you're going to be so free, you're not going to be captive to sin anymore. And you're going to let those people go, and you're going to be able to go out and be effective for my kingdom. But now, I don't want to talk about that, Lord. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about something else. Now, this is all taking place in private, right? Between you and the Lord. And the Lord just keeps drilling down. He keeps pulling back the layers. He keeps exposing what really needs to happen so that his kingdom can come, so that he can be honored, and you can live in a way that fulfills his will, not your way. Now that's getting real in prayer. That's taking this to heart and applying it. This, that, that's, that's way more than, hey, you over there, I forgive you. Nah. Eh. They're sorry anyway, right? That's what people do. No, I'm telling you, you get in your closet, you get alone with God. You, but God, they hurt me so bad. Yes, they did. I know that. You know, they hurt me on the cross. They hurt Stephen when he was persecuted and died the martyr's death, right? Yeah, Lord, but they said some mean things to me. Well, yeah, they did. The enemy prompted them to do that. So that he could stop you from being effective for me. Would you please forgive them the way I forgave you? Would you please make that right and return to the body of Christ? You've been out for a lot of years now. I've gifted you. I need you there. I need you to give financially. I need to give of your gifts. I need you to be an effective, a fervent servant of mine in the body of Christ. Can you imagine all the believers who are genuinely saved, who have church hurt, if they got in their prayer closet and all that was made right and they all got back in church, can you imagine? The enemy would be just shaking because we prayed this way and God did his work. That's called revival in the church. That's, what that, 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 that's personal revival that spills over into corporate revival, and corporate revival spills over into the proclamation of the gospel that brings about great awakenings, and other people's lives are changed for eternity. That's what it's about. And I close with this word. If. Let's pray.